Let's talk about result cache. Even with result cache memory allocated, sometimes you run a query and it doesn't seem to use the result cache. And you've done all the right things. You said, I've got a result cache size set at the database level, so I've allocated some memory in my shared pool for the result cache. I'm using the result cache hint, and yet things are never cached. What is going wrong? I thought I'd present a very, very common kind of scenario, a common error that happens when we're trying to use result caching and we get burned by it not being used. Someone's saying, I'm trying to get this current month's sales. Overriding thing, the most common reason why a result cache will not be used is our mantra, a database mantra, which is correctness trumps speed. And that is, like almost everything inside the Oracle database, our fundamental goal is always to give you correct results over every other thing. Uh, a good example of that is, for example, if you do a count star from an indexed table. You know, people say, how come I can't use the index? Well, if the column is defined as nullable, the index possibly might not contain all the entries, and therefore we would refuse to use the index. By default, Oracle will always choose correctness over speed unless you explicitly say it's, it's okay to not do so. It's like query rewrite integrity for materialized views. By default, we have to guarantee the materialized view rewrite will give the same results unless you explicitly say, I'm gonna relax that, those settings by setting query rewrite integrity. So by default, correctness over speed. And that's why sometimes we won't use result cache if we have a questionable in terms of correctness. So let's look at some examples of that list. So I'm gonna create some sales here. The scenario I'm gonna talk about is doing this month's sales. Let's create some sales. And unrelated to result cache, I thought I'd show you a little quick tip here. When you're trying to populate lots and lots of data for test data, I might be doing a lot of stuff. For example, I want some uh, random numbers. This table here is going to have 10 million rows in it, this sample data I'm creating here. And I'll show the data shortly. Calling DBMS random to get random data 10 million times is incredibly CPU expensive. DBMS random is an expensive function to run. And as long as things are roughly random, maybe that's all I need. So if you ever had to populate large volumes of data and there are expensive functions in there, sometimes you can cheat. What I've done here is I've said, I'm gonna go get 10,000 random amounts for my sales, but only 10,000, not 10 million. But I'm gonna materialize that, so now I've run the DBMS random function only 10,000 times. That's gonna run fairly quickly. Then I'm going to use that amounts table as an input to populate this table called sales with 10 million rows. How do I take 10,000 rows and multiply it out to 10 million? I simply repeat it a thousand times. So this way I get 10 million rows, but I've only called DBMS random 10,000 times. It's a cute little trick to limit the overhead of expensive calls. It doesn't matter if it's DBMS random or square root or anything which is gonna be CPU intensive. If you can get away with running it less, things will run faster. And just a little tip there for populating tables with a lot of rows. So this table called sales has 10 million rows. Let's see what it costs us to run a query. This one, I'm running select some amount from sales where customer greater than zero, it took around about 0.8 seconds. If I run it with result cache, it also takes about 0.8 seconds because we know that the first time you run a query with result cache, it has to populate the result cache. So this one has actually gone and run through the whole set of data. We can see here by you looking at auto trace that it actually did 35,800 physical reads. So it went out and read the whole table and with those results now, it has primed the result cache. So the second time I run it, with the result cache, instantaneous. Point out of a second wasn't a big deal anyway, but we can see here the key thing is my physical reads has dropped to zero. So instead of 35,000 physical reads, now it's zero because this query, the first execution primed the result cache, the second execution took advantage of the result cache. So that's result caching in a nutshell, it's pretty cool. Let's now do what the requirement was in our little scenario here, going and getting this month's sales. Now, how do I get this month's? I can take this date and truncate it down to the start of the month. That simply says the 1st of January. And then I can take the same thing, truncate this date down to the 1st of January, and then add one month to it. That gets me to the 1st of February, and I'm getting everything less than that. So inclusive for January and exclusive for the 1st of February. 
I run that, it takes, once again, about 0.8 of a second. 35,000 physical reads as we expect because that's the size of the table. I run that, I run it again, and it's still 35,000. I was just seeing what the time was here. It's about the same time. I don't like 0.8 of a second. Obviously, I'm a very fussy user here. So I'm gonna put a result cache on it. This first execution will hopefully prime the result cache so it takes 35,000 IOs as before. And the second execution, here's where things get a bit disappointing. You can see, I first query here should have primed the result cache. I should have run physical reads and then primed the result cache. The second one didn't prime the result cache. That's a bummer because I'm still at 35,000 physical reads. If it wasn't 0.8 of a second, but 80 seconds or 8,000 seconds, this would be a big drama. The question is why? As I said, correctness trumps speed. We know as people who architected this code that these two things are, from our perspective, constants for the sake of all of January. From the 7th of January up to the 31st of January, these two things are going to return the exactly same figure. But the database doesn't know that. It simply sees a reference to SysDate and knows that every time you run this query, SysDate has inched that little bit further on. It doesn't know that we're only interested in, in month boundaries. It simply says SysDate has said it's changed. I can't cache that result. How do we solve this? It's actually relatively easy. If you know as a developer or DBA that certain elements that are derived from a dynamic function such as sysdate, systimesamp, etc., are for the purposes of your query, in fact, static, then you can simply tell the database that. So what I'll do is I'll simply store my value of sysdate, which is today, in this variable called today, just the string variation of it. Now I can rewrite my query to reference this variable. This is now static from the sake of the point of view of the database. It's unchanging. The first execution, as I said, needs to prime the result case. So we simply do our 35,000 reads. But the second execution, hey presto, now we're getting some real value. So the most common causes I see of result case not being used are you've written a query that you can't guarantee to the database wouldn't change on multiple executions. SysDate, SysTimestamp, maybe you've got a sequence.next val in there. There's a whole range of things that you might know are unchanged for the, for the purposes of the query or for the results of the query, but the database does not. And correctness is always chosen over speed. Unlike things like materialized view rewrites where you can nominate the integrity of the results with result cache, if the database doesn't like it, you're gonna be in trouble. One of the good things is, is we've improved this with each iteration of Oracle. When result, face, result cache first came out, any reference to a sys context variable would actually immediately disable the result cache. It couldn't be used. And I was actually preparing this as an example of, look, here's another example where it can't be used, but I was pleasantly surprised. I've set the module to the value of zero such that I can reference it in the sys context module function. So this is going to come out as the string of zero, which I'll convert to a number. First time I run it, I prime the result cache. I was going to say it when I was producing this demo, because there's this context in there, the second run will also not use the result case. But I was pleasantly surprised to see that it is. This context now is now treated as effectively a bind variable inside a result case definition. So as long as the bind variable value doesn't change, we can actually use the result case as well. This is a nice little feature. I'm not sure when it came in, but it's something that has improved with result caching as time has gone on. If I change that this context variable from to a thousand, so now it's changed. The database is smart enough to see that this, even though it's a bind variable, has actually changed in value. So the first run will reprime the result cache and the second one takes advantage of it. So it's pretty cool. Things like sys context variables that are unchanging between executions can still take advantage of result cache, which is an improvement over its first implementation. I stress you do still need to be take care here and we'll wrap this up shortly about how I think we should always take care. Here's an example where UID is a user delivered function from the database. UID is not a column on this table. UID is like sister, it's a function. The first execution primes the result cache. Will it be able to use it again? In fact, it actually can. So we're lucky here that even though UID is a uh, internal function from the Oracle database, the database is smart enough to know that it's a constant. How about if I do something different? How do I know that my user ID is 104? Well, normally I would query the database dictionary to do that. So 
here I'm making my query more functionally robust. I'm saying the UID is actually the user ID for me. I'm logged on as MCDONAC. I run that. I prime the result case with the first execution. What happens on the second one? No result case this time. This is unrelated to UID in this particular instance. It's actually related to the fact that I'm querying user users. Any query to a object owned by Sys immediately disables result cache, even something as simple as user users. And we know that user ID is fixed for this session. So there are a list of rules. You can actually see this in the documentation for the result case documentation. But it actually shows you that even though result caching has improved over time, you always need to take care as to which ones will be result cached, which ones won't be. Sys date, sys timestamp, anything with times in it generally are the most common culprits. And that's what I suspect is happening here for the person that asked this question saying, why am I not getting result cache? So as we said, correctness trumps speed. The way I like always testing my result cache results is with Autotrace, as we saw just in little demos there, or anything similar, whether using SQL Developer, SQL CL, or anything that can return you information from your session stats in terms of consistent and physical reads. You can look at the execution plan. The execution plan will generally always show you if a result cache identifier is a candidate for being used, but by no means as a guarantee it will be used. I should, probably should put these in the SQL Plus scripts. In the execution plan, you'll see, yes, I'm using result cache, and here's the result cache key, um, a pointer into the memory structure. But that simply reflects the fact that you had a result cache hint. It is by no means a guarantee saying that, yes, we will be able to use that result cache. So the execution plan, the explain plan, is simply not enough to guarantee it. You really want to look at the measurements, the output of the physical reads to make sure you're getting that result cache benefit. And here's a little snippet from the documentation I mentioned before. Uh, there's actually more than this, but you can see generally bind variables, etc., are going to be okay. This is a restriction that's come out in later releases, but there are in 15.2.4.3 restrictions, temporary tables, sys schema, sequence values, SQL functions returning dates, etc. While the documentation is there and it's always valuable for me, the proof is in really testing it and actually seeing those physical reads drop with the result case. That's how you really know you're getting the benefit. <laughs>